videos over the learning targets one through three of the evolution unit and in this video we'll be talking about some different people who have contributed to uh, thought on how life came to be and current evolutionary uh, science and so first we're going to look at this concept of spontaneous generation which was largely believed by many <laughs> in science up until uh, the last several hundred years actually and one of the first people that kind of set the bar for this idea was a man by the name of Aristotle who was a Greek philosopher and he taught this idea of spontaneous generation he actually had a quote-unquote recipe for life in that you take a sweaty toga and you add some grain to it and kind of throw it in the corner and then a few weeks later you'll have some rat babies in that toga of course we know that life doesn't spontaneously kind of happen but um, Aristotle did think that and fast forward several hundred years later to a man by the name of Reddy who's finally saying you know what I'm going to try to prove this wrong he wanted to disprove spontaneous generation and he set up this experiment in which he had a jar <coughs> full of meat and just kind of set it out in the open well flies landed on the meat and a few weeks later or a few days later you have maggots well again people did not associate the flies with the maggots they thought that the maggots just spontaneously grew out of the meat well, so in order to disprove this he took the same setup except for this time he covered the jars you can see in this picture and the flies weren't allowed in therefore no maggots were the meat that did not convince people and another scientist a hundred or so well, less than hundred years later but almost hundred years by the name of Needham came along and he wanted to prove that spontaneous generation occurred and the way he did this was he took a flask full of broth like some sort of meat broth or something and he boiled it in order to kill anything that might be living in it and then he let it set out for an extended period of time well that broth began to get really cloudy because well he didn't know this but organisms from the air microbes and that sort of thing got into the broth began to grow and develop and he said look there are things living inside this broth it just kind of spontaneously happened same experiment fast forward a little bit a man by the name of Spallanzani wanted to disprove Needham's claim of doing the same experiment except for this time he put a cork over the flask and heated it up really slowly to kill everything in there and nothing grew because nothing was able to get into the flask again not convinced and so nearly a hundred years later a man by the name of Louis Pasteur comes along and develops an experiment that will finally disprove spontaneous generation but instead prove this idea of biogenesis which means that life comes from other life <coughs> biogenesis life comes from other life and so what he did is he took this flask that he's designed specifically for this experiment and it has this really long neck well the long neck lets air in but it doesn't let anything that might be in the air like microbes in and so he boiled the broth and after a time there was no growth in the broth but in order to prove that broth or growth could occur in that broth he then broke open the flask and growth occurred so this finally convinced science that spontaneous generation does not occur but instead the concept of biogenesis is true that life comes from other life well some of Charles Darwin's of course Charles Darwin being the one who uh, came up with this idea of evolution by natural selection Charles Darwin had many predecessors many people that he relied on he relied on their readings and James Hutton was one of those James Hutton came up with this idea that he looked at the rock layers he was a geologist so he was studying rocks and he noticed that there were layers even high up in the mountains <laughs> well those layers did not occur in the mountains by sediment falling on them because mountains are mountains are really high up in the air and so obviously structures like mountains had to have one time been lower and so these structures have grown up over time and this takes a long time this doesn't just happen in a few weeks a few years this isn't something that we've observed 
in humanity. This is something that's taken place over not thousands of years, but millions of years. And so James Hutton was one of the first to suggest that the world is not just a few thousand years old, but is actually millions of years old. And this contributed to Darwin's thought tremendously. <laughs> Another man by the name of Thomas Malthus, he was an economist, lived in London. And in the city of London, there was overcrowding and there was poverty and hunger. And what he noticed is that there were more people than London could support. That the human population in London was growing what he called exponentially. And this exponential growth is just simply a growth that would continue to double. And that that growth would continue, you can kind of see it on this graph here, that growth would continue until there was some sort of limiting factor. Limiting factor. And in this case, the limiting factor on this graph is food. While there's food available, population grows, but once the food reaches the limit, the population will no longer grow, it will kind of stagnate. And so Darwin uses this idea as well with his theory of natural selection. <laughs> now, a man by the name of Lamarck came along and had this other idea of evolution called acquired traits. And again, this is a competing theory with Darwin, so Darwin didn't agree with this theory, but it was fundamental in understanding kind of the difference of what's going on. And Lamarck believed that all organisms have an inner drive towards perfection, and they want to adapt to their environment. They, they want change. It's, it's a goal to, to adapt to their environment. You know, this giraffe here in this picture, it has an inner need to reach the taller leaves, and so it will stretch its neck out until it can do that. And it pushes them, the giraffe is being pushed towards perfection. Now this trait, this longer neck, is a trait that that giraffe has acquired. It's an acquired trait, meaning that it's obtained it at some point in its life. And then it can then pass that trait on to the next generation. Acquired traits that can be passed on to the next generation. Of course, we know this isn't true. I can lift weights and get stronger, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to have a baby that's already able to lift weights. Or I can study books and my children are going to have to study those same books in order to get that knowledge. It's stuff that I've acquired, but I can't pass on genetically. But Mark also had this idea of use and disuse that by using a part of your body, an animal could alter it, change it over time, make it better like the giraffe, or by not using a part of the body, an animal could lose it. So like whales, for instance. Whales at one time had four limbs. Well, they don't anymore because they stopped using them, according to Lamarck. We know this to not be true, again, but Lamarck was one of the, you know, he came up with his own idea of how species change over time. We know it to be false today. Another, by, another man by the name of Lyle came up with his theory about how the earth transforms over time, that uh, he studied changes in the earth, like erosion, weathering, and that sort of thing. And again, if this is happening and the earth is changing because of these things, these aren't rapid processes, they're very slow. And so if the earth has changed over time according to these processes, then the earth is very, very old. And so Darwin grabs a hold of this and says, if the earth is changing, then the species on the earth are changing as well. And if those organisms are changing, it also takes them a long time to change. A man by the name of Alfred Wallace had a, a theory of natural selection as well, and very similar to Darwin's. However, he came up to it, up with it independently, working with uh, Af African butterflies and Darwin sailing around the world working in the Galapagos. But both of them came up with similar theories of natural selection. And Wallace gives his essay to Darwin to read, and he, Darwin realizes, hey, we share these same ideas. And so Wallace's work led Darwin to publish his own book, which is called On the Origin of Species, and he publishes that in 1859.